we have a great guest with us today. I'm really excited to, to hear about uh, some of the marine uh, research that's going on. Um, but first things first, uh, tell you a little bit about the Cascade chapter and AUVSI. AUVSI is the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. And we are an international organization uh, that represents the robotics industry and that's uh, uh, unmanned vehicles of all types. And, uh, and the Cascade chapter is the Washington and Oregon chapter of AUVSI. And we're about 400 members up here in the Northwest and represent um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the um, aerial systems, but we also have uh, some unmanned surface vessel members and also some underwater vessel members, um, as well as um, vehicle uh, and road driving types of technologies that are part of our chapter, and we are proud to say. Um, I really want to take a, a minute quickly to, to thank our sponsors. Um, Hood Tech um, has been a long time and a wonderful sponsor of the chapter um, and um, really um, a, a, an outstanding supplier for the industry. Uh, a lot of uh, different technologies they offer, including um, imaging and uh, launch and recovery systems and uh, a lot of uh, uh, high technology uh, that they develop in, finds its way helping out uh, folks all around the world. And of course, Northwest UAV, which is the company I work for, um, longtime sponsor, um, one of the founding members, uh, along with Hood Tech, um, and uh, appreciate their, their long-term support. Uh, Northwest Aerospace Magazine is a, is a great publication that chronicles the, the, uh, the goings-on of the aerospace industry, and uh, um, they have uh, featured several of our members, and uh, they are a great sponsor. We're proud to have them. Uh, Near Space Corporation uh, is, is a, a longtime sponsor, and uh, we support uh, uh, them. And uh, they have uh, a great uh, a UAS test range out in Tillamook, Oregon, where they have a lot of, um, a lot of unique terrain and, uh, and tons of access to um, a, a range that goes both over the ocean and the mountains and uh, the coastal region. A uh, lot, lot of uh, really cool things that they do there, developing technologies um, that, uh, that get uh, unique, uh, unique data from unique places like somewhere near space. Um, and of course, uh, EPBNB uh, Insurance, a uh, longtime sponsor, great sponsor. Um, those, those folks have been insuring folks in the industry and in the chapter for many, many years. Um, very much a, a trusted uh, a place to go for your insurance. Um, we'll walk you through uh, the kinds of things that, uh, that you need uh, to, to look out for and to be aware of. And of course, Perkins Coey, um, a, a, also a longtime sponsor of the chapter and longtime supporter of the industry here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, they, they do a lot of uh, work with your intellectual property management. And of course, uh, one of our newest sponsors, uh, Technical Tooling, um, they do a great job uh, providing and developing unique ways of tooling up for especially for your composite needs. Um, they have some, some really cool technology, so, so, so be aware of them. And if you have some kind of a challenging sort of thing to tool up that you're trying to make a, um, some, some sort of a unique shape uh, out of some sort of composites, I'm, I'm sure those folks are, are there to help and uh, will do great things. Um, Orca Capital um, and uh, Randy Moe over at, at Orca has been uh, on our board and is a great supporter and Orca Capital has has been uh, a great member of the of the chapter as well, along with longtime supporter and uh, board member Wendy Kellington. Uh, really appreciate her support. Um, really appreciate her um, her her leadership in the legal side, regulatory side of the community. She's a um, nationally renowned uh, expert uh, in in certain aspects of uh, airspace and and uh, the legal aspects of uh, operating, doing operations with. So um, appreciate all of our sponsors. Um, with that, um, I really wanna thank uh, our, our, and our people supporting here. Um, Lori Brown is our executive director and I'll hand it off to her and she will uh, um, introduce uh, 
Patrick Sherman, who will be our host of ceremonies today. Lori, off to you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. First, I'd like to introduce Patrick Sherman, who is our moderator today. Most of you know Patrick. He's an internationally recognized expert in the drone community. He's an adjunct faculty member at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University Worldwide Campus, Department of Flight. He holds a level three remote pilot instructor certification through the AUBSI Trusted Operator Program. He's an FAA drone pro and author of more than 150 published articles. He's known worldwide as Lucidity, the public face of Roswell Flight Test Crew YouTube channel, and which is dedicated to drone technology with more than 6 million views and 30,000 subscribers. So with that, Patrick, I will have you introduce David. I certainly will introduce David 30 Acre. However, before I do that, I want to call Jeff Ratcliffe back to the uh, podium, as it were, because uh, in his introduction, he failed to mention some exciting news that we've had here recently at the AUVSI Cascade chapter. Uh, would you care to mention what that is, um, Jeff? All right. Uh, he, he twisted my arm and... Uh, um, and we are proud as a chapter to announce that we are the AUVSI Cascade is the chapter of the year for 2020. And so we got presented with this award at the Exponential Show that happened earlier in the month. And uh, along with that comes uh, a generous check from the national for, uh, for the chapter. And so we're, we're very proud uh, of all of you members uh, for being part of that. So thank you members. All right. And thank you very much, Jeff. Next up, as has already been mentioned, our presenter for the day is David 30 Acre, who is a professor of the practice at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, where he is the head of the Worldwide Campus Department of Flight. A retired uh, Air Force officer, he brings a wealth of experience in both manned and unmanned aircraft to his studies and to our presentation today. All right. Thanks, Patrick. And, uh, you know, Patrick is always the one uh, uh, running stuff in the on the side there, but I tell you, over the last uh, six months as an adjunct faculty in the Department of Flight, he has just knocked it out of the park. So hats off to Patrick and uh, his lovely wife, Lisa, for all that they do, uh, putting together videos and academics. It's uh, uh, just incredible the work they've done. So thanks a lot, Patrick, and we really appreciate uh, uh, everything you do behind the scenes for all this kind of stuff. All right, so the, uh, I'm looking at this massive gallery we have for the uh, participants. It reminds me of uh, about a month ago, we did a webinar that we literally had six people in, and the recording then went out, and when everybody started to see it on YouTube, I must I literally received over 100 emails asking questions about it uh, from people who viewed it online. So it's kind of a, a new paradigm where you don't have to really be present to be uh, to be watching stuff. So it's kind of kind of interesting. Um, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, not being present, this uh, coronavirus uh, it's been put a damper on all of our travel, which we normally do, as you can see from this slide. Uh, but the good news is that it's basically kept us all at home and we've been able to pursue a lot of the things that uh, have been on the, on the back burner and mainly research. So we've gotten quite a bit of research done this year as we'll, uh, we'll get in here and, uh, and discuss. Um, they, you know, we're going to be talking about marine mammals, which is up in this upper right-hand corner is the main part of this. But I just want to kind of run through a few of these. Um, and by the way, you see these, uh, these articles behind here. And uh, just once again, those are just uh, fantastic articles that uh, Patrick has put together as he's uh, participated at these events with us. So we've done some of our research looking at uh, photogrammetry and comparing that to the current uh, state of uh, uh, of uh, incident preservation that the law enforcement uses and comparing that to the, uh, uh, the LIDAR, uh, ground-based terrestrial LIDAR systems and comparing those together. And that's been, been a real popular uh, download, by the way, that's being used by a lot of attorneys now and DAs across the country uh, to justify what they're doing there. So that's been great. Uh, down in Oregon, we are doing some uh, uh, gender research, believe it or not, on, uh, on hemp plants, trying to identify that from, uh, being air, uh, from an airborne platform using using different sensors and different software. Um, there's the great uh, uh, interest on the wildlife side, um, which we're going to get into about, uh, about using drones for wildlife. And this is just a 
a good case of that where uh, Patrick and uh, Dr. Stretta went out and they did some work with uh, some Osprey nests on cell towers and actually built 3D models of it, which is quite extensive. We'd have, we've had students doing other projects uh, about uh, a remote charging of aircraft and determining how the landing precision, whether or not it's accurate enough to do some things there. Um, we've been working with a company called uh, Unleash Live um, that does some work with AI um, and uh, counting uh, different uh, different things. For example, in this case, it's just a, a a cattle yard there, but they're counting. We're using AI to count the uh, the number in there uh, using different optics. For example, IR as well as the uh, uh, the RGB as you see there. So the last two, I'm going to talk about the. Uh, the marine biologist part of this, the, the majority of it, and then also down below, we had another project that was done with AR uh, that might be a little bit interesting uh, to some of you out there. So with that, I'm going to jump into the, uh, the first part of this, which is uh, talking about an acoustic analysis uh, for uh, wildlife monitoring. And uh, this basically came about... Uh, from uh, the marine biologists to see down here, uh, Brittany, Jennifer, and Sarah, uh, who started asking questions about, hey, you know, what drones are best for this? Um, how loud are they? Um, how can we get that information to the people providing permits in order to get, to get uh, the permit issued to go out and do this kind of thing? And of course, Patrick Sherman down there, you'll see him in a couple pictures here. He was uh, uh, instrumental in getting all this going as well. And uh, we spent uh, a few uh, very sweaty days in, in hot Washington at the time when we did this um, out there and uh, uh, collecting data. So again, thanks to Patrick for, uh, for helping out. Uh, first up for disclaimer though, um, this is an exploratory study. Um, so some of the methods that we used, they were both uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative, just meaning that some of them is uh, you know, solid numbers, other parts is uh, other parts of it are, are uh, subjective type of things, so just realize that in there. Um, it, the, the analysis isn't complete and some of the things may change, but what I'm basically gonna do is present a review of the research projects that we, that we did and not the final results, just because we're still pending a publication of this. And, uh, and just, I always have to throw this out just so everybody realizes the, the intellectual property here is uh, property of the primary investigator. So we can't go using, using this stuff everywhere yet until the publication comes out. <laughs> so there's the, uh, there's the disclaimer. So what's the problem and what are we trying to do? Um, so pinnipeds, you know, generally seals what we're talking about. Uh, they're entangled out there and they have other issues um, with a lot of other human caused uh, problems. Um, but as you can see for this poor guy here on the left, he's entangled and a lot of times they are on the beaches and being able to identify them, being able to, uh, to track them, monitor, observe them, and then, and then uh, basically guide someone out to come out to help them um, is something that UAS are, are just perfectly suited for. Um, and other things about monitoring large, uh, large areas where there's a, a large population um, is also another area uh, that it can be used. And, and it just seems like a logical uh, a type of application for unmanned systems. But as everybody knows, uh, the, uh, the great applications aren't necessarily uh, uh, usable due to regulations and, and, uh, and other issues. So in this case, um, there just isn't a lot of data out there that, that looks at how uh, a drone will affect wildlife. Um, so uh, we dug into this. We learned an awful lot about the pinniped hearing, and uh, it's very, very interesting, although they can hear up uh, significantly higher in frequency than we can. Um, generally, it's fairly close to, say, a dog or a cat, um, and uh, which is, you know, not that far away from, uh, from human hearing either. So very interesting what they, can, what they can hear. So anyway, that's what we went out to do was to try and gather enough data so that we can talk people into letting uh, biologists and other scientists use drones um, with wildlife. Um, so, and that's what you see at the top was basically the research was determined the best practices um, and, the, and the aircraft and the parameters to use to be non-invasive is the, is the bottom line. So what we set out to do was uh, set that or to measure that sound pressure level or the SPL and then look at the frequency of it in order to generate something like you see over here on the right for this chart right here. So what you're seeing here is uh, the, the altitude that you may be flying at and the horizontal distance away. And we know that there's some place where you're not gonna wanna fly because it's just too loud and it's gonna be distractive and it's, gonna, it's going to cause stress to the animals. So there's some sort of an area over here like that. Well, there's also an area like back over here, it might be great acoustically, but you can't see what you're looking for. So there's kind of two exclusion areas out there. Um, and we're really looking for where those envelopes 
actually don't overlap in this case. So there's an acoustic no-fly area, there's an imagery no-fly area. Well, what's the sweet spot? And that's what we're looking for is to figure that area out. So the first part of this research is to determine this part of it over here, this acoustic no-fly. The second part is to figure out this, and we are planning to do this uh, in the near future. So what we did is we went out there and we measured the sound pressure levels and the frequencies of several aircraft. I think we tested nine, uh, 10 by default, and uh, we uh, created some, some prediction algorithms that we're looking to do, and then go out to the field environment in phase two and take a look at how the, uh, the ocean ambient noise can mask the aircraft in there. And then the whole idea was this, was to create that acceptable um, operations envelope like you see over here um, for, uh, for flying. And like I mentioned, we, didn't, we haven't done that last, uh, that last part yet. All right, so just a, just a little bit of the, uh, the science behind here and what we are looking, uh, looking at. Um, the, uh, the two charts over on the right are both uh, uh, spectrum analyzers. And uh, we took a look at uh, these quite a bit uh, to figure out which one was actually what, uh, what would work best for this. Um, so the dependent variables you see there are the sound level and our primary, our primary measurement of that was with a, uh, a type two sound meter. And a type two, it just has to do with the how accurate it is, and uh, the type two are uh, are typically used for field environment type of uh, type of studies, um, and then we wanted to visualize this too in a frequency trace, and I'll talk about why that was, and then we have a backup of human rating, and that was extremely important, and I'll discuss that as well. Um, so there were some other things that we had to worry about: uh, wind speed, wind direction um, were were always an issue, and uh, the sea state as well. Um, however. We just uh, happened to luck out with this because uh, when we were when we were doing the uh, the main part of the research, which was with all the drones, um, the uh, the wind and the wind speed were almost negligible. There was I think the the highest gust we saw was about seven knots, but most of the time it was about two to three knots. And down on the ocean as well, we were expecting twenty knot winds down there. It was pretty much light and variable, just a slight on on uh, shore breeze. So those really were taken out of the. Uh, uh, taken out of, of being a problem there. And then we had the background noise, of course, and we were, uh, uh, I'll talk about a little bit how we got, got rid of that. So anyway, over here, back to those pictures on the right, it was kind of interesting because I actually purchased some software and everything. This was done through a grant from Embry Riddle. And I purchased some software and looked at it and I went through all sorts of different microphones and tried all sorts of stuff. And uh, believe it or not, that this top one right here, hats off to the folks that create the Spectroid app because that's what we ended up using. It was exactly what we were looking for and none of the other applications uh, presented the data like, uh, like they did here. And uh, that's what we ended up using. So we, we purchased the apps to use them. Uh, you purchased the software, I should say, and we ended up using the free app. <laughs> so sometimes the app's better than the, uh, the paid stuff, right? Uh, so just to give you an idea, here's the aircraft we collected against. You can see the list over there on the left. I mentioned the, uh, the de facto one there was a, a, a Mavic 2 Pro. Actually, have a yeah a Mavic 2 Pro. We had flew the Mavic 2 Zoom. We flew both of them, um, but uh, we only had the, the uh, stealth props, which are what those asterisks are for, by the way, from the the uh, Master Air Screw folks, uh, which actually uh, just an incredible product. Uh, we noticed that the uh, uh, the stealth props that they put out actually reduce uh, significantly reduce the noise down by um, about two decibels, and that's a uh, you know that's a a significant decrease on the logarithmic scale. So we're talking about a a, a, a significant reduction in noise just using those props. But those are the only ones that had the props available that we were able to get a hold of. So those are the two that, uh, that we use. But we wanted, to, we wanted to use those since that's a, the, a configuration that, uh, uh, that we would recommend. So we wanted to make sure that it, was, uh, that it did make a difference. So anyway, those are the aircraft. Um, and uh, the, the two uh, uh, pictures on the right are basically from the sound measuring equipment that we have. I already talked about the, uh, uh, the spectrum analyzer there and that waterfall history, which I'll, again, I'll get into a little bit more in here in a sec. Uh, but then we took uh, measurements with that, uh, that type two sound device, and that's just a print out of the screen of what it looks like. We took them at uh, uh, two per second, so at a two hertz rate, we took those and generally about 30 uh, measurements for each aircraft. And then we took the, uh, or for each point that each aircraft flew to. And then we took a, uh, uh, the mean of, of all those is how we ended up uh, doing that. So where were we at? We were out here uh, near Eatonville, Washington, and uh, we had the folks out at the Story Hill 
um, observatory who allowed us to use their facility just an incredible place out there but it was very secluded out past the deck there that you can see on that left picture out by the walkway uh, it fell off downhill and uh, there's nobody down there no roads real nearby real close uh, the biggest issue we had with noise was basically a, a light aircraft coming by and doing some uh, uh, some practice in the area so you can see the setup down there uh, we had the microphone set up out in the front of the deck and uh, we were able to proceed. It took two days to gather all the data, uh, and there was uh, 35 different altitudes and distances that we collected from, uh, based on a previous uh, pilot study that I did to kind of take a look at, at what we were, uh, uh, the data we were gonna collect, you know, where the real differences uh, were for that. So I'm not gonna get into all the data. Obviously, I need to save that for uh, the publication. <laughs> so a little bit of a teaser here. Uh, so you can see this is one of the aircraft that we did. We took all these data points for each aircraft. And you can see this is based on uh, the, uh, uh, the actual uh, decibels that are on the left and then the distance the aircraft was away. Again, this is horizontal distance. This is not the uh, line of sight or the, uh, you know, the direct distance to the aircraft. So uh, you can see as, as you'd expect, as the aircraft gets further away, the noise reduces and you can also see the altitude uh, on there. There were some interesting things that have come up here that we've had to kind of adjust some of the, uh, uh, of the predictions that I'll get into in a second, but things like this you see right here, uh, when this is at 20, uh, meters altitude and it bumps out to 20 meters in distance right at that 45 degree angle. Um, we're seeing a little bit of a, a bump out of line there uh, with, the, uh, with the sound. You can see the same thing down here for 40. You see it come out here and you'd expect it to keep going down, but there's a bump up here. Guess what? 40, 40, right at that uh, 45 degree, uh, right at that 45 degree line. Um, so we did see uh, lower angles being basically quieter um, regardless of uh, how high the aircraft was flying, if it's the lower angle, it is going to be uh, uh, the, uh, the best place to be. So we're, we're uh, putting those together in our findings. Um, most likely that's because of the attenuation of the noise down a low altitude with the trees and terrain and things like that. So um, that, uh, and by the way, that falls in line with a lot of the research that's been done for a helicopter type of uh, noise as well. All right, so this is kind of neat uh, here. This is uh, the, uh, again, the, uh, uh, the spectrum analyzer and what's down below is the waterfall trace um, up above is just the other uh, frequencies up there that we're seeing um, and the peak frequencies but the real story is down below so if you take a look at uh, the aircraft down here uh, the motor and mainly that blade passing frequency is what is really generating most of the noise and everything else that you see up here going up on this waterfall history is is basically a harmonic of that that uh, lower noise. So if you run the math down here, so this aircraft was uh, this was let's see the motors are turning at about 5,200 RPM, 5,300 RPM somewhere around there, which is pretty standard, um, and that uh, gives you a blade passing frequency of right around 180 hertz. So it's basically uh, you know the the uh, RPM divided by 60 times two, since you have two blades out there as they're passing. And that's exactly what we're seeing right here is we are seeing right at about that 180 uh, hertz point. That's where we're seeing the, the most noise being generated, as well as down here, um, the half uh, of that. So very interesting. Previous studies have found the same thing. And then as you move up here, by the way, this right here, this is some of their noise. You can see how constant it is that did not come from the aircraft there. Um, and then you can see as this bumps up and you can tell these are harmonics because you have the same thing down here as, uh, as we're seeing over here in this area. And you can see that repeated. So you know that's coming from the same source since it's kind of fingerprinted of that. And that runs all the way up um, and getting into this area right here to two to 3,000 uh, hertz in that area. And then it fades out once you get um, above about that 500 or 5,000 hertz level, it really fades out uh, going up from there. So those are the main harmonics, the main things that we're hearing off of the, uh, the aircraft are in, uh, in those areas. All right, so uh, predictions real quick from all the data we collected. So we collected data on all those different aircraft at all the different points, and uh, we're trying to figure out the best fit and correlation so we can uh, make a prediction. And uh, we were able to do that actually with fairly good, depends on the aircraft, but with, with fairly good accuracy. Um, uh, for those of you who are stats uh, uh, geeks out there, somewhere about a 0.85 R squared, which is, which is uh, really uh, exceptional. 
Um, and then we also added in a little bit of correction for the angle as well to make it even a tighter prediction. And the predictions came out much better than I expected. And that allowed us to create basically to operate an envelope uh, that's about 120 meters horizontal by 120 meters vertical and allows us to predict for each aircraft what the noise level is going to be at all those locations. Uh, so we took, the, uh, we took a look at the aircraft we flew in phase one, and we selected um, some to go out for phase two, the lowest, uh, uh, the lowest uh, sound aircraft there. And we jumped out to uh, Grayland, Washington, uh, the famous disappearing beach area out there. And this is where we went and did the, uh, and did the research. The uh, four aircraft that we went out with were the, uh, the Mavic Pro, the Mavic 2 Zoom, uh, the Anafi, and the, kind of the outlier, the Power Egg X, which was, you know, it was quiet. And, but the other reason why we wanted to add it in there was because it has a uh, waterproof shell. And, uh, and that would obviously be something that you'd be interested in. If, it's not a, if it wasn't a beautiful day like we had out here, it'd be something you'd definitely want to, uh, uh, want to have available. So we wanted to bring that to just kind of see how, uh, how it compared. Uh, we are set up in this location right here. We had the onshore breeze blowing this way, and we flew the aircraft uh, uh, right out in this area over here uh, so that the, the uh, wind wasn't blowing the, the uh, sound directly at us or away. But again, the wind was very light uh, when we were out there. And uh, again, we had, we had an ambient noise out there of about, about 62 and a half was the average of the uh, the ambient noise from the ocean. We had anywhere between about a half to one meter waves coming in. And just for comparison of all these aircraft over here, uh, the loudest one we had uh, was at about 45 decibels in the previous test. Now, some of them, the Inspire 2, um, were up here a little bit higher than the 63, uh, but uh, the ones we took out, they were all below. So they're all below the noise floor. Um, so what does that mean? It means that you can no longer use instrumentation to be able to, uh, uh, to, to tell how loud the aircraft are. So we had to use our subjective ratings for that. And again, the good news is that the pinnipeds and human hearing, uh, they are, although they're not exact, they are fairly close um, to, uh, uh, to the same. So we're able to use those, uh, those different ratings and then we compared those to the predictions. So this is uh, uh, what we're talking about right here. So we have an ambient noise out there at about uh, 62 or so uh, decibels. And that curve down below uh, is what the prediction is for the noise of the aircraft. So the question becomes how far below the ambient noise does the aircraft need to fly or need to be before you can't hear it at all? Because it's, it's fairly interesting because even though the aircraft is say 10 decibels below the background noise, because of the, the distinct noise and the unique noise that the aircraft makes, you can still hear the aircraft. Um, and that was fairly interesting. It just has to do with, with the, the type of noise that the aircraft's generating compared to, the, again, the, the, uh, the sound pressure that the, uh, uh, that the environment is creating. The environment was much more of a, a white noise, if you will. It was spread across most of the spectrum, whereas in the aircraft, as you saw in the, uh, the previous slide, has very distinct harmonic lines as it goes up. So, so that's what we wanted to look at, was how far below that noise floor did it need, it to, be, need to be. So we had, took all the subjective ratings and everything, and uh, we put all that together. And uh, we're able to come up with uh, uh, an interactive chart. So, and this is kind of where we're going with this whole thing. Uh, matter of fact, we're looking to build a, an app that will do this. So the idea here is that you can take the aircraft that you're flying, you can take a reading on what the background noise is. And believe it or not, most of the apps uh, on, uh, uh, that are available for a smart device they're actually pretty accurate, generally within about four decibels. So it gets you in the ballpark. Uh, but the idea is you can be able to take that reading. In this case, I, I entered it for a 40 decibel background noise. And uh, then we took a look at what the aircraft prediction was and compared that and then interleaved the subjective uh, ratings that we gave it. And believe it or not, it all correlated beautifully. Uh, again, much to my surprise, but it correlated very, very well. And uh, that gave us this interactive chart. So what you're seeing right here, for example, is that uh, down here in this area, when you're 10 meters above the, uh, the sensor, this case, it's a seal down there, <laughs> and you're uh, 10 meters away, um, at that point, you're about 16 decibels above the noise floor. And as you start moving away, by the way, 40 decibels is still fairly quiet. This is not even close to being an ocean out there. 
Uh, matter of fact, you have more than 40 dB right where you're sitting right now, most likely. Um, so that's, this is fairly quiet. And but you can see as this moves out, you start to get to the point where now the aircraft out here at 80 meters is below the noise floor and it runs out, uh, runs out from there. And we just, the, the color coding on this is just, uh, again, a subjective, but it's uh, basically what we saw um, as far as the subjective ratings. Um, you can also see a little, little bit of difference between it's, it's better to be to go out this way at a lower angle than it is to be high at a, a higher angle there just because of the noise propagation. Um, it's also good to remember that this is only for a single point. So, for example, if someone was to fly over a large group of animals out there of wildlife, um, you don't really know how far away you are this way. So now you're going to have to just use an altitude. So that's where we're going with this. And it's, uh, we've had a lot of attention from uh, NOAA. Matter of fact, literally uh, 10 minutes before this, I got a, uh, an email from some uh, NOAA scientists that are very interested in this data uh, that, so they can start using it. And the, the whole hope here is that with this data that the, the, issu the, the issuing permit agencies um, now have something to go by where they can take a look at and they can, uh, they can issue more permits to be able to use drones in this type of, uh, uh, in type of a situation. So with that, there's our beautiful team uh, that we had uh, running out there uh, as, uh, at the, uh, the Mount Rainier, uh, obviously Mount Rainier in the background, but that's at the Astari Hills Observatory there. So with that, um, I have some other things we can chat about here. So like I talked about the, uh, the AR type of uh, research that we've done, but Patrick, why don't we uh, see if there's any questions here? And uh, if not, I'll jump in, but if there are, let's uh, get, those, get those answered now. All righty. Well, David, there do not appear to have been any questions, although I'd certainly throw it open to our audience to uh, jump in now. And, uh, you know, if you have questions, go ahead and post them and we can address this topic before we move on to our discussion of augmented reality with the use of drones. And by the way, uh, 30, we're doing just fine on time. So I think it would be great to hear about that AR question uh, when we're uh, when we're done here. So. Excellent. And, and hopefully the, uh, the slides are, are keeping up. I did a presentation the other day and, you know, one of those things about doing everything from home, it's based on your internet. So my slides are about 45 seconds behind and it was a little hard to, a little hard for people to, uh, to see what the heck I was talking about. So hopefully that worked out today. I of course can't speak for everybody, but um, I, uh, I can tell you that uh, it looked just fine on my system. So Anyway, oh, and, and we do have a question came in. Tom wants to know, well, first says thank you for the briefing, but then wants to know what was the biggest uh, surprise or discovery from your efforts? And if I may just chime in, I would say that it's that everything sort of worked out better than we hoped it would. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right, Patrick. Uh, yeah, Tom, and everything, uh, it, when I started to run the statistics on this, and I, I mean, it took me, you know, about two weeks to run everything uh, upside down and around, and Again, I'm not going to get into all the results here, but it was surprisingly um, correlated. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was pretty amazing. There were some things that were uh, some anomalies, and a lot of that had to do with the, uh, uh, the angle at which you're, you're observing the aircraft. So I already mentioned that, you know, that 45 degree and above zone is kind of where you don't particularly want to be unless you're higher. Um, but the other thing we noticed was there's just a lot of other things like the braking that you're using on the aircraft, how fast you're maneuvering it to stop that really makes those, uh, those abrupt noises come from the aircraft and being able to fly very slowly and uh, not really slowly, but more, uh, 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 precise and smooth um, ended up being definitely the way to go just because there's so much variance on the noise. And then the other thing was, was uh, when the aircraft is up, uh, right above out to about uh, 10 meters or so uh, the noise was all, it was all very similar, but it was also um, variable in that if the wind catches the blades a little bit, and the aircraft, the aircraft tips into it, um, it will make some more, uh, uh, some more noise there. The other big surprise for me, you know, a lot of times they're, uh, uh, the advertised, uh, hey, buy this prop or buy this camera, it'll, it'll be great. You know, a lot of those things are shiny brochures. And uh, when I purchased the, the props from, uh, uh, from Master Airscrew for this, I was skeptical and I went out and uh, it was really, really nice to see that they actually did exactly what they said uh, that they did. And it was significantly quieter, you know, again, uh, two to three dBs and, you know, three dBs is twice. Uh, so the sound pressure level was, uh, was, was different with those. And that was great to, great to see as well. 
All right, 30. Uh, no additional questions have come in. And of course, we'll welcome further questions on this subject and on the uh, subject of uh, augmented reality and drones as we continue. So if something does occur to you, please feel free to send the question in. Otherwise, 30, I'd say we are ready to continue with your second presentation. All right, sounds good. So this was a, another very interesting thing that uh, I'd wanted to do for quite a while. And we had just happened to have a, uh, an event um, that we gathered the data a, a year ago from. Um, and uh, we finally got, like I said, we finally had some time to, to get to it and, and, uh, and, and analyze what was going on there. Uh, so the big question was, hey, we have some spark glasses here. Let's take a look at these. Um, you know, a big problem with, uh, with especially new drone pilots is that they spend 90% of their time staring at the display. And you say point, and one of the things that we like to do in our classes is we see that happening. And instead of saying, look at the aircraft, we say, point to the aircraft without looking at it. <laughs> and uh, now they have to start thinking about it. And, and we, as soon as you do that about 15 times in a, in, during one flight, they start realizing they have to look up at the aircraft. So we really wanted to see how this changed that. Um, and uh, the specifics of it, you know, we did it in a field, field environment. Um, we did it with automated and manual flights. And basically what we did is we had another camera that recorded the pilot while they were flying. And uh, then we analyzed the, uh, the head position to see where that pilot was focused. By the way, uh, Jeff Coleman is one of our grad students, and he was the one that uh, ended up putting all the data together uh, uh, that uh, he and I worked together on this one. So I just want to have a shout out to him um, for some great work that he did. Um, and anybody else who's looking to do cool stuff for their master's degree, you know, we get to fly drones and, and do stuff like this. So sign up for Embry Riddle classes. So did I get my pitch in there, Patrick? Was that okay? All right. So before we uh, dive in further, further uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of questions that come up about VR, AR, MR, and they're all kind of grouped together. So I always like to throw this slide out just to say they aren't the same thing and they are different and specific. So just so we're on the same sheet of music, virtual reality is basically it's a virtual. It's all virtual experience. If you turn off the switch in the VR glasses, there's nothing else that you can see. Okay, it's black. Um, so the example is, uh, you know, you put the goggles on and there's a table in front of you and there's a cookie jar on the table and it is all, um, it's all virtual. You can't see it. So this brings up an interesting question though, uh, is FPV VR? Um, because most people think of it as VR, but, and again, this can be argued a couple different ways, but in my opinion, it's not VR. And that's because you are not looking at a, the objects are not digitally created. The objects in there is just another display. So what you're really doing with, with FPV, you're just looking at a, a, a specific display. It's really not a, a VR type of environment. So if you look at a, a, a VR simulator, some of the games out there, when you put the, when you put it on and everything is digitally created, that's definitely your VR environment. So augmented reality is just a little bit of twist on that. Um, it, you're able to see through the glasses. So if you, again, if you turn off the, uh, the, the glasses or the goggles, you're still able to see your surroundings. So you see the real environment and then it overlays some sorts of virtual or other objects into that. So going back to our example, you now put the goggles on and uh, there is a table in front of you that's an actual table that's in the room. The table's there. You can see the table and on top of it, you now have a, a virtual cookie jar that is digitally created that's sitting on top of, uh, on top of there. So when you jump into mixed reality, it's kind of blending all this stuff together. Um, so now you have the coffee table is still there. It's a real, or a real table in front of you sitting there. You now have the digitally generated uh, uh, cookie jar on top of it, but now you can interact with the cookie jar. You can take the lid off the cookie jar. You can reach in there. You can take a cookie out. Okay, so that's kind of mixing it, uh, mixing it together. Now that might be with your mouse. It might be with a uh, some sort of a, a a glove type of setup too. But you can you can manipulate the different things out there, and it's the reality is mixed together. So where the heck do smart glasses fit into this? And uh, we use the uh, Epson Mavarios, and those are kind of in two little bit different categories here because uh, they are smart glasses in one case where they're doing kind of what FPV does. It just puts the display up there, uh, but there's also capabilities to do other things with it. But for us today, we're basically just overlaying the video of the drone inside what you normally see in GCS, inside the glasses. So we basically have... <laughs> 
We have a, a, uh, an FPV that is being displayed on augmented reality glasses, just to confuse it a little bit. So I just want to make sure that, uh, that we have a little bit of background in what those different things are. So uh, that's what we're doing. You see Dr. Burgess down there. He's wearing the glasses, and uh, he has the display from the uh, GCS inside those glasses. Okay. So after that, uh, <laughs> let's take a look at the aircraft we used over there on the left, uh, kind of our standard uh, lineup of stuff we use. Uh, but realize we did use two different setups. So this one here on the left, instead of the, uh, the tablet right there, you see a little Android computer. And uh, that has uh, Go 4 loaded on it. And that is going to be what drives then uh, the display coming out here, going up to the glasses. This is a different setup over here. This is the BT35Es. And in this case, we're basically taking the HDMI uh, feed off the back of the, uh, or actually off the front up here, um, of the uh, remote controller and running that into a, uh, a junction box, which then drives these. So there's two different, two different methods that we used uh, for this. So I already mentioned this, we went out, we took a bunch of videos, uh, 305 minutes of uh, total video. Um, we did it both during automated flights using Pix4D because we figured that was going to be the one where people were really staring at the GCS was during automated flights. And then we also did some with, uh, with manual flights as well. All right, so 16 automated uh, with AR or without AR, 10 with, and then nine with AR. And like I said, we measured the... Uh, uh, how much the head was moving back and forth. Okay, so who cares? So this gets to the, uh, here's the results right here. By the way, this is published. Um, so uh, um, it, it is available if you're interested in looking at this study. Uh, but this is the real, uh, uh, this, is, is, this is the crux of the whole thing right here. So you can see on the left side, um, this is how much time was spent heads down. And you can see with the GCS without AR, um, we're spending 68% of the time. And again, these are all AUVSI top level three instructors that are that are flying the aircraft. So they're they're looking at the display 68.4% of the time when they don't have AR. When you throw in AR, they are now 32.2%. So a big change in the amount of time that they are actually heads down looking at the GCS instead of the aircraft. And as you'd expect, the same thing over here, this is for how much time you're looking at the aircraft. So when are you focused on the aircraft? And when you're when you don't have the AR goggles on or the, you don't have the uh, the Epson glasses on, we're looking at 20.5 percent of the time. So only one fifth of the time are or these people, these pilots, looking at the aircraft when they were flying. 20 percent of the time. That's that's pretty amazing. Again, these are all very experienced pilots. So on the right hand side over here, you're seeing um, without it. I mean, I'm sorry, that's, with, that's without it. And then with AR, they're looking at the aircraft 56% of the time. So again, um, one, it was another, just like Patrick mentioned earlier, this was a huge swap. We really weren't expecting this big of a difference. Um, and it, it was really, really noticeable. And I'll talk about why we think that was here in a minute. Just something else to look at here. Um, if you just put these kind of together, um, if you're looking down at the, uh, the, the GCS, I mean, you're flying without the, the AR glasses on, you're looking down 68% of the time, you're looking up 20% of the time. And if you take a look at what it's like with, with the glasses, 32% of the time you're looking down and 56% of the time you're looking up. So it pretty much swapped the amount of time when, when peop, what people were looking at, which was, again, was, was pretty amazing to see that. The uh, manual flights uh, was even more surprising in that, now keep in mind, we're in Arizona, and the sun's out, and what happens to your display on your tablet? It gets washed out, right? Um, even with the Hoodman covers that we always use, it's still difficult to see the details in there. So this gives you an idea, though, with, with uh, uh, the gla Epson glasses, we had the pilots looking at the aircraft 96.3% of the time. Um, let me rephrase it. The pilots were the head was pointed in the direction of the aircraft. It might not be staring at the aircraft, but they have it at least in their peripheral field of view 96.3% of the time compared to the GCS only 2.2. So that's pretty crazy um, when, you, when you look at that. And I think there's some pretty good reasons why. So just as far as the discussion and, the, uh, and what happened here, um, yeah, we saw a significant increase um, in the amount of time the pilots had the aircraft in the field of view. Um, it decreased the downtime. Uh, basically reversed it, like I mentioned. And, you know, the interesting part here was the manual flight. They, we had image capture. So this wasn't just, hey, go fly around. This was a, there were specific tasks that the pilots had to do. 
Um, they obviously took off. They flew up to a specific altitude. They flew over to a point. They had to be right over the point at a specific altitude. And then they took, took photographs uh, in different directions. And then they moved to two other places and did the same thing with different altitude and different directions. So there was, there, it wasn't like this was just go fly around and they're looking through you know, the FPV feed. This is, they are manipulating the camera and doing everything else. Normally, this probably would have been a 90% heads down type of mission because of, of all the parameters I asked them to fly to. Um, so the, the reason why we believe on this, and we actually have comments from the pilots about this, was because the increased contrast that are available with those smart glasses. And that, there's a caveat, though, that's if you have the right, uh, the right uh, shade on. There's a couple different shades you can wear. Um, but the contrast was so much better that you were able to see uh, all the parameters much easier. You're able to see and identify the, uh, the targets in the, uh, uh, in the uh, the glass is much better than you could looking down. So we're pretty sure that's why it was. And like I said, we heard some pilots talking about that in the videos while they were doing that. And as you'd expect, there was a learning curve there. And uh, uh, we had, uh, you know, some, some interesting things going where you, you're not necessarily looking at the aircraft, but you're looking next to the aircraft with it still in the field of view at something that might be a little bit darker to increase contrast, even more like the, the clouds or, or, even the, or even the ground. So fairly interesting. Um, another uh, great uh, application of this uh, was as a visual observer. And you can see over here in this photo, you know, this is, this is the, the PIC right here, right? What's he looking at? Just like uh, everybody else, he's staring down at that, that, that iPad right there. Whereas if you look over here at the visual observer, what's he doing? What he's supposed to be doing? He's looking at the aircraft with the glasses on. Um, but what the pairing up of these two is it now gives the visual observer the, the glasses that he can look through. And uh, now they're talking about a common picture. So in this actual, this photo right here, these gentlemen are out trying to find a, uh, a particular object out in the desert. And they're able to now talk off of the same picture. Instead of saying, no, no, what's that? And crowding around the display, they're able to just sit there and go, no, off to the right, just above that, you know, move it, bump it up, bump it up. And they're actually able to talk off the same picture, which was huge. Um, so it really helped out finding the targets and subjects that we had them doing uh, for, uh, for that. And also it increased the overall team awareness because now the visual observer can see what the battery levels are. He can see what they're looking at, um, all those different things. So it really was a huge benefit in that area. It's also, in this case, this is running through the HDMI feed. It's a great backup uh, for a GCS failures and, uh, and all that kind of thing. Um, and if you are using the little, the little Android computer, it allows you to access things like, uh, you know, checklists, uh, the weather, Lance, all that kind of thing you can access uh, through there. Matter of fact, I have mine set up. So I go to the uh, the Skyward page, which is who we use, and I'm able to log into Skyward and do all my mission plan and everything right there using the glasses. So it's a pretty, pretty effective. All rosy, right? And that how it always is, Patrick? Every, that's, the, that's the glossy brochure. So when it works, it works great, right? Okay, so let's talk about Absolutely. the rest of the story. <laughs> Here's the rest of the story. Okay, the pictures say it all over there, right? Take a look at uh, the cableology <laughs> going on over in these, uh, these pictures here. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's hard to minimize uh, this when you're using an HDMI feed. And uh, you can see, you know, we kind of went from the uh, everything's kind of out there and all over the place to a much, a, a much better situation where we have zip ties. We actually have the interface sitting on top of the hoodman here. So everything's right there. Um, but hey, it's, 30? It's, yeah, go ahead. We, we, you're, you're, the quality of your sound just abruptly changed. It sounds like we're getting some digital distortion. It may well be in the internet, but I was curious if you could just check the hardware on your side. Yeah, there's not much to check. Let me just cycle that. Does that happen to be any better now or is it still bad? It's, uh, it's just the same as it was. I mean, you're, is it, is we, it sketchy? We can, we can hear you, but you sound like a Cylon from the 1970s Battlestar Galactica. So I'd say let's just press on and hope it resolves itself. All right, we'll see if Starbucks shows up. He was at West Starbucks, right? Wasn't that him? I got to start He was one of them, okay. along with Apollo. <laughs> there you go. Let's not forget <laughs> Commander Adama. Excellent. Um, well, I'll try maybe talk a little slower here, um, but the pictures say it all. Um, you have to have a plan for this. One of the other, and I think the biggest issues uh, with this up here in the upper right-hand corner with that computer is that it's an extremely old 
Android vision version. I'm not sure which one it is, but I think it's like five, maybe four or five. So most of your applications are not compatible uh, with it. Uh, we tried sideloading several on there. I was able to get some on there like uh, Google Maps, but others like uh, the Parrot FreeFlight Pro, uh, it would not run on there. So that's the biggest limitation is, is just that. Um, it's also not compatible with some of the, uh, like the Mavic 2, the, uh, the second, the follow-on they have. So the RC1B a remote controller, it's not compatible with that. Um, the mouse pad is slow and kind of dis difficult. So if you can imagine you want to type in your maximum altitude, you know, you're now, you know, using a, a, a mouse to touch the buttons or to touch the values and it's kind of tough. Um, so anyway, and it just, uh, and it, my biggest pet peeve is uh, it's just another battery to charge, right? <laughs> so something else to forget to charge and end up not being able to use it. So that's kind of the reality. Is it uh, something I would love to use all the time? Absolutely. If I could get this computer up here to work 100% of the time and with a new Android version in it and never have it, uh, uh, it freeze or have to restart it while I'm flying, I would use this every single flight that I'm flying on just because it, it's, it's just it's just so many benefits from using it. Um, but because of the user interface problems, the cable issue, the old version of Android and everything else, um, I'm really excited for the next version to come out because it just makes it, it just makes it difficult the way, uh, the way it is for this. But with that, we also have uh, eight sets of them in the Department of Flight and uh, we use them quite a bit, so. All right, so the conclusion, I basically talked through all that kind of stuff, so guess what, Patrick, we're at questions again. All righty, well, I'm taking a look around and we do not immediately have any questions. Um, although I, I did not participate in this research, so it was certainly very interesting to me. Did you try any other systems? Uh, you, you talked obviously about the um, the Epson system uh, brother, best known as a printer company, makes a um, makes a monocle. So you've got a little video monitor hang that which hangs in front of one eye, so you can glance down at that, you know, and not have to you know physically tilt your whole head down to look at your display. Is that something you've looked at or thought about? Uh, that particular one, no. Uh, but the original plan on this was to use Hololens. Um, and as you probably know, Patrick Hololens is kind of like the, uh, you know, the, the top of the heap as far as anything that's mixed reality uh, made by Microsoft. And uh, we uh, played around with the, uh, what was it called? Uh, it's like, the, not the commercial version, but it's like the, it's like the SDK version of it, if you will. Um, about five grand for a, a set of those. The problem with these was it just didn't have the, uh, the contrast in that to, to use outside, even with some sort of a visor on it. It just didn't have the, uh, the contrast for being able to use it outside like we, like we wanted to. It really wasn't designed for that either. Um, it was designed for, uh, you know, working inside places and things like that. So it just didn't have the, uh, 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 the contrast and the brightness that the, uh, the Epson glasses did. Got it. And then we do have a question from Barry who wants to know, uh, what we see, what you see as the next steps in th this technology. Well, uh, you know, like I mentioned, this is, this, it's great technology and my hat's off to Epson for doing this and pioneering this area and actually making them affordable for, you know, the regular, the regular drone pilot out there. You know, these things are, you know, somewhere around 500 to $800, somewhere in that area. Um, you know, and the fact that you get an Android computer with it and that kind of stuff is great, but but uh, you know, there just has to be um, better uh, compatibility with all the rest of the apps, you know, and, and uh, you know, take it out one step further. Why can't I just hook up my, my phone to it and have some sort of Bluetooth output that does this or something like that? Um, by the way, I didn't mention uh, latency, um, but latency is a little bit of an issue. Um, anybody who flies FPV knows that you want as little as absolute possible. Um, but when you're doing normal photography, data collection, and things like that, it's not quite that big of a deal. Um, in order to get the, uh, the Parrot products to work, what we had to do was a screen mirroring. So now you're taking your iPad and you have a program on, the, uh, uh, on that uh, little Android computer that allows uh, screen mirroring. And so now you mirror the screen of the iPad onto the uh, smart glasses. And we saw anywhere between about a half to up to a second and a half of latency in that and that basically made it unusable. 
So the mirroring option just just was too much latency. You know, you're trying to yaw the aircraft to to take a picture in a direction, then you overshoot it by 90 degrees. You know, that type of thing was happening. So, um, but that's kind of where these need to go. Um, you know, as always, we always want better resolution. We want we want better contrast in the glasses and things like that. Um, and, and there is they are working on the next version of this that does have a better uh, a computer and everything else. Um, so hopefully they, by the way, they, they have this data. So hopefully they're, uh, uh, they're looking at it and, uh, and realizing that, you know, this is a huge benefit, uh, to flying because you're able again to keep that aircraft in the, uh, uh, in the field of view. Um, and you think about where that goes with like right now you have ADSB feeds on, uh, some of the, uh, the DGI products and other products. Now, can we, can we put that into the glasses and that type of thing and overlay different things? So now, you know, for example, there's a no-fly zone. Well, I see the no-fly zone actually in the glasses now. Um, I see the altitude that I can fly up to in the glasses or something like that. So there's a lot of, uh, of application uh, for this type of technology. I'm kind of excited to see where it goes. Uh, 30, I have a, uh, another sort of question, sort of a shared experience. I also happen to have a, a pair of these glasses and I reviewed them for the YouTube channel. And my experience with them was somewhat problematic. Uh, and uh, admittedly, I did not fly with them for a long time. So I guess I'm looking to you as a more seasoned user is that I found like, for example, if I was flying my drone in front of trees. And as you know, we've got plenty of trees up here in the Northwest. I sort of would lose track of which trees I was seeing through the, the camera on board the aircraft and which trees I was actually, you know, seeing through the glasses in, you know, good old fashioned Mark one reality. Is that a, a problem you experienced? I mean, the, in the desert, <laughs> there aren't as many trees. Yeah, absolutely, Patrick. But uh, you know where I live up here in the Northwest and we have a few trees around here. So um, just like with that, any piece of technology, the first time, you know, you try using it and it's uh, uh, there, there's a lot of learning that goes, uh, that goes into that. And I probably have flown, I'm, I'm guessing 30 to 40 hours with these. Um, and you know, the first five, I was uh, saying a lot of bad words, um, and went from there, but you, you, you start finding techniques to get past things like that. So for example, I rarely look directly at the aircraft, you know, that one of the pictures that I had here, which I think is kind of the original idea that Epson had when they started this was how you'd be using it, like this picture down in the bottom right, that I'm looking through there and I see the aircraft out there flying, right? I see what the aircraft is looking at. So this is kind of that situation you were talking about, Patrick. Right. I find myself never doing this. The aircraft is generally right over here, just off to the side. So I can still see it. It's in my direct focus right there, but now the display is just off to the side. When you do this, it can become incredibly uh, disorienting just like you said. And that's, okay, and that's exactly what I did. All right, well, maybe I'll crack them out and uh, try it again with that approach. That, uh, that, that's, that's very interesting to know. I mean, so it's, it's not just sort of a, you know, yay, we've got a new system. I mean, that like, like when we apply any new technology to this or any other field, there's sort of a learning curve and some techniques that have to go, have to go with it. Now, that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And I see that uh, I see that Tom had a question kind of talking about the uh, uh, some sort of a uh, 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 well, yeah, other cues. Yeah, exactly. Oracle cues that go into this um, that can be, be added into there. Um, interestingly, that uh, uh, both of these uh, you can you can hook up a speaker to them and you can have uh, you can have headphones um, on there as well. And uh, and use the uh, uh, the Bluetooth capability to be able to transmit uh, sound back and forth. Obviously, you need a microphone, uh, but that's really an interesting idea, Tom. I think that uh, you know is kind of the next step to this. Um, you know, like you said, when you're when you're looking at the uh, uh, the collaboration between that that pilot and the observer, um, you know, there's definitely what we found too. By the way, was there really wasn't a set. Uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a three dash one, or I don't know what you actually call that, uh, the, uh, the brevity code. <laughs> what does it mean when I say X, Y, or Z? Um, you know, it was all just, uh, you know, plain English. Um, there probably needs to be some sort of a, uh, you know, brevity so that when I, when I uh, uh, say, you know, move, move right, there's, you know, how far right, you know, is obviously the next question. <laughs> so uh, there's definitely some space for that in there too, but that's a really good question, Tom. I think that might be something for some good follow on uh, research here. I am, um, uh, Tom, if I may just add an observation to that, which has nothing to do directly with um, with these, but I think it it's something which illustrates the point. 
Um, I, 30, I don't think we played with this, uh, but we, he mentioned we used the Power Egg uh, as one of our four finalists in the sound test. And it's an inexpensive sort of built for consumer drones. I mean, it's not, it's not a DJI. It's never going to be a, a big commercial player. But nonetheless, it was reasonably quiet. And it incorporated a number of nice features. And one of them, which is an oral cue, is that most modern drones these days, including the Power Egg, have a collision avoidance capability. They've got two cameras that form a binocular picture of the world and then discern from that when they're getting close to an object and they beep or buzz or something to let you know how close you're getting. But what the power egg did, which I thought was very, very smart, was as you got closer to an object, the intensity and the pitch of the beeping both increased. So in the, in the good old days, you, if you wanted to get very accurate information about how close you were to an object, say during an inspection mission, you had, to, you had no choice but to look down at your screen in order to see a visual indicator saying, hey, you're eight meters off this thing. Whereas relying on audio cues from the controller, as a power egg did, I, uh, it, it, it made a surprising difference in the ability to... Um, to manage that aircraft. And so I, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right that oral cues are, that, that's kind of unutilized bandwidth in the drone space. And I think uh, smart manufacturers could do a lot more than they are with that. And did absolutely everybody tune out while I was saying that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, absolutely uh, spot on with that, uh, with that, Patrick. Yeah, like I said, nothing to do with this, but, uh, but an interesting observation that tied into the use of oral cues. So um, are there any other questions? I don't see them, if there are. And I notice we are 12.35, which is pretty much our, uh, our quitting time for the presentation. So uh, 30, I think it just remains for me to thank you for uh, taking the time to present this to us. It's, it's good stuff as always. Um, and particularly it was very interesting to see for me, because I was already familiar with the pinniped study, for me to see the, um, see the work that you guys are doing with the VR glasses. I was broadly aware of it, but this was the first time I, I sort of got a detailed rundown on good stuff. Good stuff. Oh. So 30, thanks very much. You bet. And if anybody has any questions about any of this, uh, uh, 30AD at erau.edu. And I'm sure that, uh, that Lori will throw that email out there and uh, just drop me a line anytime. All righty. In the meantime, we will let you report to the imperious leader uh, as your voice continues to go through the Cylon voice filter. And I will turn the presentation back over to Lori, who's going to take us into the networking section. So 30, thanks so much. Lori, take it away. Thank you, Patrick, and, and thanks again, David. Thanks everyone for attending, and now we'll skip into the networking session. But before we do that, I wanna make sure that you know that our next webinar will be November 19th, which is the week before Thanksgiving. Typically we do these on the fourth Thursday of, of the month, but because of Thanksgiving, uh, we'll have it on the third, as well as I think the same thing happens with December, uh, Christmas, uh, the holiday is like the fourth week. So just to make a note of that for your calendars. And also uh, please watch for our survey. We'll be sending out to all of you to provide feedback from our webinar today. And again, we wanna thank our annual sponsors who Jeff mentioned at the beginning of the session. The networking session. Sure, I'm Erin Herringshaw and I'm with Aerospace Futures Alliance. So, uh, you know, Lori, we've got some um, involvement with AUVSI and drones and that kind of thing, but prim our primary objective is that we provide the advocacy in Olympia on behalf of aerospace. But we are, have our hands in all kinds of stuff with space and all these new technologies, satellite, drone, the whole thing. Oh, excellent. Well, hey, Aaron, uh, this is this is David 30 Acre. You know, I live out here by Eatonville. So if you ever if you ever need anybody or anything else going on with uh, some of this research or academia, please, uh, please let me know. We work quite a, quite closely with uh, uh, the uh, the universities here as well as the, the local schools and some other things. So always awesome. available. Oh, I, maybe we should connect. And Lori, you could always uh, connect us. And I was thinking about some people, at least one that I work with with AR and VR, wondering if you've connected with him so wonderful yes i'll make sure that you have each other's contact info thank you Lori. right you and you and i should uh check in too and see how things are going in our crazy new world <laughs> absolutely well, let's yeah. do that 
I love it. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Erin. It's great uh, to meet you. Thank you, for you too. We'll be talking soon. Okay. All right. All right. Well, stay thanks. in touch. Thanks, Yes, Aaron. thanks. Bye-bye.